MFA stands for multi-factor authentication, and it's a mechanism which requires additional verification besides your username and password. You've likely seen this as an SMS message, a code emailed to you, a pop-up on your phone, a one-time code in an app, or a physical security key. For a long time, I had some misconceptions about MFA and which methods were best. So if you were like me, hopefully this video can clear up any confusion you might have. This article on privsec.dev has a great summary of the different methods, and I'll be linking that down below if you want to give it a read. So I'm going to be using this tier ranking chart that was popular on YouTube a while ago. I like to think of myself as timeless, which just means I'm late to pretty much every single trend. So let's start with the absolute worst, and that's going to be SMS and email. SMS is a little bit worse than email, which I'll explain why. So SMS, you're going to get an F, and email, I'm going to give you the E. So let's start with the worst, which is SMS. It's unencrypted, vulnerable to phishing, and it's probably the easiest method to compromise. So SMS relies on your phone number, which means that a malicious actor could perform a SIM swap attack where they either social engineer your provider to port out your number to a different SIM card they have control over, or they pay someone a hundred bucks at the AT&T store to do this for them. So this actually happened to one of my friends. One morning he realized he wasn't getting any text messages on his phone, but he started getting emails that someone performed a password reset on one of his financial accounts. And it turns out that someone who works at a local phone carrier store ported out his number to a different SIM card. So since the malicious actor had control over my friend's phone number, they were able to request a password reset on his account. And then in order to validate that it was my friend requesting the password reset, the financial institution sent a one-time code to his phone number, which the malicious actor had control over and thus they were able to successfully reset his password. So the fact this method is vulnerable to any support person at one of these companies who could be socially engineered or someone who could be bribed for a couple hundred bucks makes this method extremely weak. So this method could actually make you more vulnerable to attacks based on the fact that most companies will send you a one-time code to your phone if you call into support and are requesting help, or if you need to validate a password reset, again, they'll send you a text message to your phone. So with that being said, I still had this method enabled for quite a few accounts. I'm still deciding if I should disable it or not because they don't have any other MFA options available. So email is similar to SMS, but I think it's a bit better. It is a little more difficult to compromise an email account in my opinion, which protects this method a little bit more. But at the same time, if someone has access to your email address, they'll be able to reset your password and they'll have access to your MFA codes. So that's not really ideal either. It's also worth mentioning that both of these methods are vulnerable to phishing and social engineering. So as an example for the SMS method, so let's say I go perform the password reset, it sends the text message to your phone number. I could then call your phone number and spoof the caller ID of the company that I'm trying to log into the account for. I would say I'm from that company, we observed some suspicious activity on your account, we sent you a one-time code to validate that you are indeed the account owner, and you might notice in those text messages it usually says so-and-so company will never call requesting this code. That's to prevent these social engineering scenarios, but that's usually where someone who is trying to social engineer you will start getting aggressive and say, well, if you don't give us the code, we're going to freeze your account, we're going to lock your funds out, and unfortunately, most of the time, people will then give up the code because they don't want to lose access, and now that malicious actor was just able to log into your account. So the next one is push confirmations, and these are definitely better than SMS and email. So we are going to skip the D, we're going to give it a C. And while I was in college, I learned that C stands for credit, so not a horrible grade to get. So what this method relies on is a push confirmation being delivered to your device where you are already logged into the service. When you get the notification, you need to tap confirm or yes that the sign-in attempt was indeed you. So in theory, this method sounds great, but I think it has two flaws. The first being that a company will usually rely on a third party to deliver these notifications, such as Duo, which means you now have to rely on this third party from a security perspective. And if they are compromised, then this extra layer of security is essentially useless, or it could even be abused, where they send out malicious push notifications with links to malicious sites or phishing sites. So there's all sorts of things that could go wrong if that third party is compromised. Now let's say there is no third party and the notifications are handled by the site you're trying to sign into, such as Google. This is better since you're no longer relying on that third party, but this method is still vulnerable to habit. Each time you sign into your account, you are conditioned and trained to see that notification, select it, and tap yes. So there's a chance you're at work, it's a busy day, you check your phone quick, you see that notification, you instinctively tap yes, because that's the habit that you've built whenever you see that notification. You didn't give it a second thought, and what you actually did was allow a malicious actor who had your username and password to log into your account. Again, this is better than the email and SMS option, but it's still not great. So that brings us to time-based one-time passwords, which is my favorite in terms of looks, which I realize is a very strange thing to say about an MFA method, 
but anyways. So you've likely seen this one before. Typically when you are configuring it, you'll scan a QR code or input a shared secret, which is the string provided by the website you are setting this method up for. So going back to the name time-based one-time password, that shared secret along with the current time is used to derive a code that is valid for only a short time. Typically these codes are valid for 30 seconds plus a grace period, which is usually 30 seconds after the code has changed. Some popular ways to store these codes are Aegis, which is an open source app, or Google Authenticator. So I'm going to rank this method a B. It is above push notifications, but it does have some downsides, which is why I'm not going to give it an A. So this method is vulnerable to phishing and social engineering. Someone could social engineer you into reading them the code, or if you're led to a phishing site, you could enter your username, password, and one-time code. The attacker could then on the back end pass this information to the legitimate site and then log in on your behalf. Most apps that store these one-time codes allow you to view those shared secrets. So if someone gets access to your app, they can then copy all your shared secrets, set them up in their own app, and then have access to all your one-time passwords. There are some methods to storing these shared secrets so they can never be retrieved, such as using the Yubico Authenticator app if you have a YubiKey. The last method I'm going to cover is FIDO. FIDO2, which stands for Fast Identity Online, and the 2 is for the second version of FIDO, is the most secure form of MFA. For that reason, I'll be placing the hardware token in the S tier above everything else. There's a lot of technical details that go into this method that I'll cover in a future video, but for now, here's the basics. FIDO2 is the client to authentication protocol between the security key and the computer. When I say security key, I mean something like this. This is a YubiKey. There's other manufacturers that make hardware keys you can buy that implement the same protocols besides YubiKey, but that's what I use. WebAuthn is what handles the actual authentication with the website. It uses public key cryptography for authentication, and it also uses unique cryptographic keys with each internet site. This means if you end up on a phishing site, they won't be able to get the correct response to the challenge with the hardware key, which means that this method is then invulnerable to phishing attempts. It's also worth mentioning that the way the authentication works, the key is not identifiable between different service providers. So let's say you have your key registered with your banking website and with your Google account, it will be impossible for those two registrations to be linked together to the same key. So while this method is by far the best, it does have some downsides, or what I might call more specifically, inconveniences. The first is that you need a physical device to perform the login, so if you don't have that physical device with you, you can't use it. Seeing that it's a physical device, the only backup you can make of it is to have another physical device, so that means you must purchase another hardware security key. With the one-time password method that we discussed earlier, you could have that one-time password configured in multiple different apps on multiple devices, since it's all done in software and this adds no expense. The other downside to FIDO is that support for this method in general is just lacking. Funny enough, from what I've found, the industry lacking support the most for this method is the financial industry, which is ironic since that's where I would like to use it the most. The only financial institution I found in the US that supports it is Vanguard. So if you do have your money there, I would suggest looking into this method. The only other method that Vanguard supports is SMS, and we saw the downsides to that method. Typically, a lot of people have their retirement savings in Vanguard, so you want to make sure you protect that as much as you can. I recently purchased two YubiKey 5C NFCs, which I'll be covering in future videos. They cost around $55 a piece. They aren't the cheapest, but if you do plan on using them, make sure you purchase two. You want to make sure you have a backup in case the first one stops functioning or you lose it. And most sites won't let you disable the less secure MFA methods unless you have at least two keys enrolled. Your protection is only as good as the weakest method you have enabled. So let's say you have one YubiKey registered with a site, and you also have SMS enabled as a fallback option. At that point, you might as well not even be using the YubiKey. I would suggest you start with looking at the most important sites that you use, such as your financial sites or your email accounts, and making sure that firstly, you have MFA enabled on those sites. And secondly, if you do have it enabled, disabling the less secure methods and opting for the more secure methods if it's supported. I would also suggest picking up some hardware security tokens if you have the means to afford them. I also came across a site, dongleauth.com, which is sponsored by NitroKey, which is another security hardware token vendor. They do a great job at summarizing which websites support one-time passwords or WebAuthn and FIDO. So it's a good place to start. Go on here, check out the services that you use, make sure you have MFA enabled so that your accounts are secure as possible.